that they are the problem. That the policy, this is basically like why I don't believe there can be reform from within. Because if they are making the policies and in their words, which again, they are allowed to make up whatever story they want. By their own definition of the policies that they have, they can do things like this. So mm -hmm. this is why the only answer is to defund the police and take money away from these overbloated apartment um, departments. Because, you know, I mean, all last year we learned that um, in city budgets, the police budget it constantly is getting raised at the expense of other other social programs. And what this does is they say, oh, we need money for training, for diversity, bias, implicit training. And as we can see in videos like this again and again and again, the problem is the institution. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I saw earlier today, which was just so heartbreaking and frustrating that it seems as if the um, reform um, measures and laws that are being um, pushed in Congress have basically stalled and it looks like they're not going to go any further. And that is just embarrassing. The biggest mass movement probably in the history of this country of people during a pandemic was to defund these departments across the country because Everyone knows, everyone knows that they have far too much money, far too many resources. And it just shows a lack of complete willpower and honestly respect from Democrats, moderate Republicans in Congress. Um, because people have been fighting, people with their loved ones who have been murdered by police have been on the front lines. And finally, there is also public agreement in that. And the fact yeah. that you know these bills in Congress have just sort of quietly died is just more videos like this, more and more and more. And you know, what is it gonna take at this point? I really don't know. Yeah. No, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of the political will and the fact that you I've never seen more of a disconnect from the popular will, right? We always talk about, you know, oh, things like Medicare for all, acting on climate change, everybody likes that. Well, also things like a severe if not defunding of the police, reform or defunding of the police. But we can't even get the most basic reforms passed. You saw the popular will on the streets. And so I've never seen a more disconnect between the politicians mm -hmm. that are supposed to represent us and the people who have took to the streets, like you said, in the middle of a pandemic to actually voice their opposition to these acts of cruelty. And you know, look, this is one act that um, I think really does demonstrate the amount of cruelty, sicking an animal, a dog to bite, to drag to the ground, a unarmed man who was not resisting arrest, who was already cornered by three police officers. I think that's the definition of cruelty. Mm -hmm. And it's not just me saying that, uh, I wanna turn to two, two folks weighing in on this incident. The editorial board of the St. Louis Post Dispatch writes, this incident bears all the hallmarks of cops deciding to issue their personal form of street justice, inflicting pain and punishment on the spot instead of waiting for the courts to do their job. It's almost like, they enjoy it. It's almost like they are they like letting go of the dog, even though this suspect was already under in custody, was already being detained. It's almost like, oh, let's just let go of the dog one more time and see what happens. Yeah, that's great. For trespassing. Um, I want to, you know, obviously a lot of people, I think I'm thinking about the dog in this case, you know, mm -hmm. the idea that you could train an animal to do something like that. Um, there's an expert, uh, Michael Gould, who specializes in all of these police tactics uh, that are used um, using canines. And he says the fact of the matter is it's a human reflex to resist a canine coming at you. You can't have an 80 pound dog puncturing your skin and be compliant. It's virtually impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, any final thoughts, uh, Caroline, before we wrap? Just quickly, we need, we gotta get the dogs out of there. This is like, liberate the dogs. This is, it's, it's same with horse cops. Like, get these animals out, you know, they, it's it really is sad that these mm -hmm. animals are trained to do a specific job for, you know, whatever type of criminal, but now they're just being, let loose and you know you have to wonder if it's just 
police trying to abdicate their own responsibility, putting it onto these animals that you have trained. I mean, what is right. the, the, you know, the dog whisperer, he always says there's no bad dogs, only bad owners. He doesn't say it like that, but it's basically like, yes. however a dog acts is directly a reflection of the owner. Of course, you know, not in the case of like certain rescues and stuff like that, but a trained bred dog. Yeah. 100%. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we used to yell at the NYPD in my activism days, get those animals off those horses. Uh, and with that, <laughs> uh, that does oh it for God, the damage so report true. on a Thursday without mm -hmm. Johnny Sliderola. Caroline Johnson coming in, Francesca Fiorentini coming in in the pinch. Caroline, thank you so much. Everybody, check out Knock LA and all of Caroline's work. Thank you so much. So great thank to be here. Hell yes, and thank you and to all the damage report, the, the entire team just crushing it this week. Uh, and remember guys, stay safe out there, stay sane out there and slay out there, bye.
Welcome, it's indisputable, good to be with you. We have a lot on the agenda today. Ladies and gentlemen, breaking down news of the day with me, none other than my dear sister, Nina Turner, former Ohio State Senator, TYT contributor, and got some new things coming out as well. Everybody should pay attention to the great Nina Turner. We will have that in just a moment. Let me go to my first story. Uh, this is horrific. A firefighter decides to kick a mentally disabled homeless individual. Here's the video. Now I want you to pay attention to a few things in that video. Number one, it was a firefighter who decided to kick this mentally disabled individual. And it was noted that the person had something going on, did not care. This firefighter is supposed to be a mixed martial artist. Now, I don't know martial arts. I do know that part of the training is discipline, is conduct. Values are at the core of any martial arts training program. Well, this wannabe badass decided, hey, let me show all of my colleagues what I can do with my martial arts skills. So you think you get points, buddy, for kicking? A disabled individual who's already on the ground is ridiculous. But also notice how nobody intervened, how nobody said, wait, guy, stop. You're a firefighter, what are you doing? This individual is supposed to be a first responder for medical attention, fires, etc., to help. But he kicks, he kicks a person who's already on the ground. Where I'm from, you get no points for that whatsoever. Let me give you some background to this story, a Dallas firefighter who is a trained martial artist, kicked a mentally disabled man in the face, then punched him repeatedly after he was detained for allegedly lighting a roadside grass fire. The Dallas Observer obtained body cam video of the incident in which Kyle Vess was kicked and punched by Dallas Fire Rescue employee Brad Cox before being tased by police officers. So the one two combination, ladies and gentlemen, the one two combination, a kick from a firefighter and then a taser from a cop. This is now suing cops in the city of Dallas, alleging excessive force and the lack of training on dealing with mentally ill or homeless people. The 2019 incident, remember this happened in 2019. We now have the video, there's now a lawsuit, but the incident happened in 2019. The 2019 incident left this man with a fractured orbital socket and sinus, as well as a cracked tooth or cracked teeth. According to his attorney, his face is now numb and the right side of his body trembles. The incident reportedly worsened Vess's existing mental disability, which resulted from a, from a previous traumatic brain injury. Wow. Nina, sister, this is horrific, even if he did not have the pre-existing brain injury. Now, injury on top of injury, firefighters teaming up with cops. Yeah, in some of the worst ways possible. I mean, look, some of the most highly regarded professions, nurses, teachers, and firefighters. Yeah. And this firefighter is definitely taking it to a whole nother level of low. And not only do certain communities have to worry about the police, now it looks like we have to worry about firefighters. You know, this is it is a shame. And as you laid out, the 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 gentleman already had some exacerbating conditions, and this just made it worse. And not only does he not the firefighter get zero points, we're gonna put him in the negative for doing this. I hope that Mr. Kyle Vess wins his lawsuit and that 
people are fired and others should be held accountable for just standing around. You cannot just stand around and allow your colleague to do whatever they want. And doc, you talk about this all the time on your show. This wasn't part of protocol. Yeah. This person just decided that they were going to do this to this young man just because they wanted to, just because they had the authority. Again, what is done in our name? Taxpayer dollars are paying for the salaries here and people should be held accountable. But one more point, training. Training is important in terms of dealing with people who may have mental illnesses, who may be going through an episode, got it. But there should not have to be any training for some basic human decency to treat somebody with respect. So some of this stuff, you know, they 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 taking the blame on training a little too far in my book. I agree with you 100%. I think the whole notion of we need to do better training. We need to make sure we have more diversity training, more sensitivity training, bull. No, no, I, I, I'm good with it, but that is not going Tire to solve your people. problem, right? That's right. Your, your problem is cultural. And That's as long it. as it remains cultural, it doesn't matter what training they have. And if you look back at these guys background, they got plenty of training, plenty of it. They simply don't bring it to the field because the culture is antithetical to the training and the decent logic and sense they have before they get there. All right. Okay, let me shift. Um, Michael Flynn, this was really interesting. Michael Flynn said that the vaccine is going to be in your salad dressing. Now, let me say this we researched it. Even though he's wrong, there is some research happening around plants. And a vaccine, but here's what Michael Flynn said. You know, somebody sent me a thing this morning where they're talking about putting the vaccine into salad dressing or salads. Have you seen this? Yes. Have you seen this? I mean, it's and I'm and I'm thinking to myself, this is the bizarre world, right? This is definitely the bizarre world. So there's the seriousness of what this what this professional realized he was doing wrong, and he and he's now you know he's found a new way, and then there's the there's just the laughability on the other extreme that people are, I mean, these people are seriously thinking about how to impose their will on us uh, in, in our society. And it's, and it's- Take away it your freedom of choice. Okay, so remember Michael Flynn, the guy who admitted to being corrupt, received a pardon, was a national security advisor, but lied on his application about what his true interests were, that guy. Michael Flynn is now a QAnon believer. He talks about extreme conspiracy theories on a regular basis. He has even insinuated that it is okay to kill people who do not agree with you. That Michael Flynn. I did a little research here. I have a great team and this is interesting. While Michael Flynn intentionally decided to be misleading, we will give you the full story. Here's the story, COVID-19 is not being put into salad dressing, COVID-19 vaccine, not being put into salad dressing, nor has anyone proposed such a thing. However, similar mRNA vaccines could be grown in edible plants like lettuce. And that is something that is now being actively researched. A few days before Flynn made this comment, the University of California Riverside published a news release about a research program that was attempting to turn edible planet plants, excuse me, like lettuce into mRNA vaccine factories. UCR said that the National Science Foundation had provided a $500,000 grant to pursue the research. One of the problems with the current COVID-19 vaccine and similar mRNA vaccines is that they need to be stored at cold temperatures. If the program is successful, this new vaccine making vegetable would basically solve the temperature issue. That's the genesis of what the research is for. Michael Flynn gets a hold of it and says, ah, they're putting COVID vaccine in salad dressing. And then the guy on the radio station or podcast, whatever the hell it was, he said, "Oh yeah, 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 I got that same memo. You a damn lie. That that memo never went out. Nobody ever said that." But this is how it continues to permeate, and they continue to validate their own lies to each other in real time. There is no memo saying there's a COVID-19 vaccine inside of salad dressing. Uh, Nita Turner, you've been in positions before 
where people have made up just ridiculous things, completely intentionally misguided those that put trust in them. This is nothing new. No, not at all, Doc. And and the and Mr. Flynn knows better than that. He could have did a little research too to find out what the truth was, but the truth does not comport itself with the story he wants to tell. Right. You know, I had a friend who always said, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. They are adding to vaccine hesitancy. We know we have a crisis with that in this country. And it just, it is an absolute shame to have somebody who once was led folks, misleading mm-hmm. folks right now. Uh, with this information, and you know, not to make light of this, Doc, but I'm just saying, putting it in salad dressing. Now they research and let us, let the science community does do what it does. But but I would say, put it in uh, sweets, you know, cakes. <laughs> let me tell you, might have a better chance of people taking it. Then. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm having a light moment. I just want people to know that. Don't yeah, misread I, this. Listen, um, let me tell but, you. For, but yeah, he's somebody that once led folks is now deliberately yeah, misleading being, people. Being ridiculous. You know, yeah. my biggest vice is sweet tea. I'm from the south. <laughs> Don't judge me, okay? <laughs> All right, okay. Um, you know, maybe a semblance of justice here. A young man kicked in the face, stumped by police. What well, charges are forthcoming? Let me remind you of the video. Here it is. Take your seatbelt off. Take your seatbelt off. Okay, okay, okay. I'm down. I'm down. No resisting! Oh, oh, oh. Get off! I'm not resisting! No resisting! Yeah, you are! Give him your hand! Give him your hand! Give him your Give him your hand! Give me your hand! Give him your hand! Oh, oh. Oh. Give him your hand! Here, here, here. I'm on it. I'm done. I got one. Give him your other hand! Ow! Here's the update. Two Central California police officers have now been indicted. Put up a picture of what they did to this young man. Okay. If you look closely, you will literally see a boot print in his face. A stamp, if you would. Devin Carter was pulled over in North Stockton on December 30th, 2020 for driving erratically according to the report, okay? At a speed faster than 100 miles per hour. The team led officers on a brief chase, during which an officer collided with a citizen's vehicle before officers successfully used the pit maneuver to stop Carter and use force to arrest him. Former Stockton Police Department officers Michael Stiles and Omar Villapudua had previously been fired in March after it was determined that the force they used against the 17 year old kid. Devin Carter was completely outside of department policy. Four officers were involved in the arrest, but only two so far have been indicted. Let me show you a picture of the police chief. His name is Eric Jones, there he is. He's the supervisor, he's the guy in charge. The buck stops with him. 17 year old kid, we see the video initially. Everybody says, "Oh, there's no crime here. He should not have been uh, leaving the scene. We would not have had to do this." Here's the thing: I'm so sick and tired of people talking about, "Well, why, why wouldn't he just comply at first? That does not excuse criminal activity of the officer. I want to remind you: the 17-year-old took no oath to uphold the law. He has a responsibility to, but not an oath to. The cops took an oath." to uphold the law, that's number one. Number two, we pay for those cops. We don't pay for Devin, taxpayer funds those police officers, okay? They are accountable and responsible to the public trust that has been placed inside of them. Okay, now Nita Turner, you saw this, obviously a decent update. I think all four cops should be indicted, but two of them have been indicted based on what was presented. 
It is a decent update. Again, 17 years old. Yep. He is a young a young man, a kid. And a lot of times black children or black young people do not get the same type of empathy and or sympathy, respect of life as other people's children. They're just treated any old kind of way. Law enforcement officers are not supposed to be judge, jury and executioner. That's that right. is why we have a court system in place. And under no circumstances, or especially in this circumstance, should an arrest lead to a beating that leaves a 17 year old boy with a boot mark in his face. Every justice loving American should be outraged by this. Yeah, and everybody who loves the Constitution, right? Yes. Uh, because the Constitution talks about due process. Yes, sir. And if you love the Constitution, you also have to love that clause that says everyone must, must have the benefit of due process. When you have a cop showing up like this and basically dishing out punishment when they are simply supposed to apprehend because we are all innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. When you have this violation of the public trust and elimination of due process in the practice of policing, why are those on the right that love their damn constitution so much not outraged? All right. We got more, it's indisputable, stick and stay. So a lot of progressive office holders are doing something fun. I like fun, they're doing the last two years in two minutes. Okay, we're gonna try it here. First, I wanna let you guys know about the years before that. <laughs> hey, remember we started the Just Democrats here on the Young Turks. It was officially launched on our air, basically by you guys. And then we featured AOC, we featured Cory Bush, and Ro Khanna became the first ever Just Democrat incumbent, all on the Young Turks. Now the last two years have been a spectacular follow up to that. So let's put the two minutes on the clock and do this. Young Turks got to start back in 2002, and I think we've been an important part of the progressive movement ever since. What we mainly do is amplify the progressive voice and candidates out there. And I think we've done a pretty good job. Right now, we're currently number one most engaged news politics network online, beating CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC, all of them. We're number one in total minutes watched. That means not only the number of people watching, but how long they watch. We just crossed 20 million followers and 500 million monthly views. Now, why? That's because actually the country's progressive. It's two thirds progressive. And you guys have allowed us to be your voice and we're incredibly thankful for that. So what did we do with that voice? Well, let's look at 2019. We went all over the country talking to you guys and the candidates. So we were in Miami, we were in Detroit, we were in Houston, and we were in Iowa. In fact, we were all over Iowa. You guys were all over Iowa and all of the candidates saw you guys. We had wonderful people speaking like the one and only Nina Turner at our rallies, Bernie Sanders stopped by, Andrew Yang, Elizabeth Warren. We interviewed almost everyone on the campaign trail with the exception of Biden and Buttigieg. <laughs> and we held them accountable. We even did a progressive economic pledge and so so many wonderful people signed on to that. Bernie Sanders, Warren, Marianne Williamson, AOC, the entire squad, Justice Democrats, and so many others. Now, on top of all that, we started a show called A Conversation, where we featured so many progressive thinkers, writers, and candidates. And one of the candidates we featured in 2019 was Jamal Bowman. Here comes Jamal Bowman. Then we had an amazing 2020. We hired a climate reporter, damage report past 500,000 subscribers, Young Turks past 5 million subscribers, we're getting the message out to more and more people. Bernie Sanders comes on in the heat of the primary. He comes on after the election to say what we're gonna do for the future. And then Marie Newman wins, Jamal Bowman wins, Cory Bush wins. And then just when you thought it couldn't get any better, here comes Nina Turner, hello somebody. And she's running for Congress and she comes on the Young Turks first. On election week, we had nearly 2 million hours of viewing with number one destination for progressives. You made all that happen. This is amazing, and thank you for those two years. What, I went past two minutes? Of course! Viewers had asked for an interview with the TYT lizard. Mr. Lizard, 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 lizard. Oh, you changed colors today, nice. I don't even know how you feel about us. Do you, do you even like us? Well, you guys made me this awesome house, so uh, I'm kind of in your debt. I was found outside on the street, and you gave me a home.
Granted, it was a really crappy home for a while, but <laughs> but then then through the power of fundraising, I became a person who has a multi-level Trump-style mansion. <laughs> you you do. By the way, you never look better, man. Normally, uh, you're just green or just brown. But today you're in mid lizard, right? I, you know, I'm not very smart. I, yeah, I'm a lizard, so I don't know how the science works. I guess this is just my mood. It's not every day that thresholds like this are broken. I'm just so excited. I can't contain my pigmentation. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're showing it off. Yep. Look, yeah, I've never seen the lizard like this before. All right, welcome back. Always good to have you. We got a lot of comments. Thank you for engaging this show. Let me first read some things that will interest you. New members only. So if you're not a new member, you need to become one, all right? New members only show featuring Senator Nina Turner debuts when? Today, after the Young Turks. Tune in to Power Hour. Look at that superhero. That's actually her inner spirit that she gave us for that graphic. Tune in to Power Hour with Nina Turner, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time on Thursdays. We are so blessed, so fortunate to have Nina Turner at TYT. Speak truth to power, fight the power, get the power, use the power. Power Hour with Senator Nina Turner, uh, Jenk uh, Ugar. Listen, this is going to be a, a crazy combination, first of all. Um, but in order to get it, I need y'all to do something. You got to sign up now, okay? Go to tyt.com slash join, tyt.com slash join. It's real simple, real easy. Also, uh, don't forget tomorrow, yeah, a special XL bullpen, full debate, Charlie Kirk. Turning Point USA, I went to Phoenix, Arizona. I'm not bragging, but I will say this. I came, I saw, I conquered. We recorded this last week called Debate Night with Charlie Kirk. I cannot wait for you all to see that. So make sure you are with us tomorrow. And we're now on podcast, we're everywhere, Acast, Apple, Spotify, so you can take this show anywhere you go and have all of these great, great I wish you Karen Woods or the bullpen news of the day. All of that is right there. Make sure you follow and give us five stars, okay? All right, let's get to some of these amazing comments. TYT member Just Be Anti Racist says, Dr. Richie, I ordered my son the I wish you Karen Wood tea, and we received it yesterday in the mail. My son wore to school today. He is so proud of his indisputable Karen T. And he wore to school. And tell your son I said this, okay? The first teacher who complains about his shirt, that is Karen. All right? 
Alaskan snow dragon. There is no martial art teacher in the world who would approve of this. I hope his sensei reads him the riot act or just kick his ass. I mean, that's what they do, they fight. So, you know, let's spar. Uh, Kelly O'Hara, my poet says, Michael Flynn singing ballads about vaccines spiking all the salads. Is peak Q nutty, <laughs> creamy goodness. <laughs> I'm more than overjoyed to witness new ranch French Thousand Island and Caesar. Now with 5G to make us receivers. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> because at first they were saying it was 5G technology, now it's salad dressing. It's not even in the same ballpark, okay? Um, Land of 10,000 Rink says, um, sighing here, my judo instructors 50 years ago uh, were so adamant we were learning a sport, not violence. Now I need a Flynn salad from Trump Tumbling Towers. <laughs> Uh, Mickey C the silver hair dragon, stumbling on his face while his face was pressed against the road could have caused more than broken bones. He could have had a concussion or permanent brain damage. You're absolutely correct. That's why uh, medical professionals and police, they call that a red zone because it can cause serious injury or even death. Uh, YouTube super chat, Jim Adelberg, Turn and Richie, best combo on YouTube. Really, I think it's the best combo anywhere. Um, YouTube included. Thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for your generosity. Trudy Lawrence, Dr. Richie going to get my <laughs> going to get my tea. Everyone, get your tea with this southern gentleman. Yes. Not a bad idea. Uh, Nicolette Horatis, uh, Doc, I was invited to our local university to discuss police accountability. I found myself channeling you. And what landed the hardest with the audience was, when you call the cops, you call a gun. Thank you, my pleasure, and thank you for doing what you do. Um, progressive, AKA Maple Syrup Dragon, love the show, thank you for all you do. Nina, always awesome to see you on the TYT network. So you are going to be in for a treat because she is here. Harpus, one eight, I8. Outstanding information of the highest respect, thanks. My pleasure, our pleasure. Um, Holly Todd, uh, they are testing the meme. There is no song called F the Fire Department. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that, that is funny and absolutely true. Um, all right, uh, C3339409, you're anti-vax, but you'll eat processed, prepackaged or fast food, yeah. Um, bed, head, and bean. 50% of police brutality cases are disabled, mainly disabled black people. Uh, Celtic Dragon, martial art is also supposed to be used for defense of self or others. That's true. Uh, not assault and bullying, 100% true. Um, Twitch, Mike Boy raps. Yeah, you can't kick a downed opponent in MMA either against the rules. Okay. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish a Karen would. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a Sunday? You're going to feel free. Back off. I'm going to tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. Hi. Hi, good morning. Okay. 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 That doesn't work for your medical. She has a disability. Yeah. That doesn't work okay. for your disability. Okay. What's your name, please? Can you please leave? No, no. I cannot please leave. You can call the police. You can call the police. You have no right to refuse service to the camera. Okay, I wear a mask. So you wouldn't let a veteran come in here because he can't wear a mask? Absolutely not, because it's. Do you know? 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 Do you Wow. Um, there's more. But first, let me just remind you, she says, I'm calling the police. There is no mandate here. I'm PTSD. And I am invoking 
the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Here's more video. Can we get your business card? Oh, okay. You can leave. You cannot come in my area. You cannot come in my area. Do not touch me. Do not let the phone be You just touch me. You just touch me. You just touch me. Get out of here. I don't care. Get out of here. You just touch me. Bomb. You know, family. She lied and people lied. Bye, guys. Email. Bye. Don't read the night. 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 Don't I mean, Karen coming in with reverse psychology, Jedi mind tricks, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, PTSD. What else you got, Karen? Oh, 911. Uh, I mean, Karen is throwing everything because obviously this must be the best damn Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles in the world. Yeah, they're at Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles in Orange County. Ma'am, you got Uber Eats. You got DoorDash, you got all kind of ways to get that damn chicken special out of Roscoe's. But they didn't come there for the chicken special. Now, notice she's talking about civil rights to a black manager who's literally wearing a Juneteenth t-shirt, okay? I'm sure the woman knows a little something about not only the struggle, but since she's a black woman and has been black um, for I don't know how many years, maybe her entire damn life. She knows a little something about being black too. But the audacity of this Karen, once again, the Karenicity running deep. Ms. Turner, thoughts? Like I really do need, I wish a Karen would, my t-shirt, which is coming <laughs> soon for today. Cause you're right, this woman threw everything and the water fountain. Yeah. I mean, and the water fountain. You were, I don't believe they came in there for the chicken. They they came in there to start mess. Right. They, they really did to, to create a scene, make an episode, and to start pure unadulterated mess. But it's, it's really getting deep. You know, from this Karen uh, quoting the 1964 Civil Rights Act all the way to saying to her, you know, 50 years ago, you would have been drinking from a different water fountain. You know, you asking for a lot more than to get served some chicken. Yeah. They came in with an agenda, obviously, they wanted to go to an establishment um, that was anti-mask. And by the way, um, settled case law as well as statutorily, businesses do have the right to enforce things like no shoes, no shirt, no service. That no can guns. also include, right, no, no gun, yeah. no mask, okay? Right. Uh, this has not been an issue. As a matter of fact, Republicans typically were the ones saying that these were rights of particular companies. And now because it doesn't fit their narrative, they're now saying companies should not have the right to enforce the laws traditionally they have actually supported. So it's really weird, ironic and hypocritical how their entire narrative, their political platform has shifted because of a mask issue. Companies have the right to do exactly what they're doing to protect customers and their establishment. Let me take you to Memphis. In Memphis, a woman involved in a violent 2020 arrest claims that she had a miscarriage following the encounter. Let me take you to the video then I will give you background. Here it is. Oh my God, they literally just called for backup on this girl. Shut 
your mouth and walk Don't tell me to shut up. You break the skin. Get off of me. I'm not even under arrest. I'm suing. I'm so dope. This is, um, it's really hard to watch. And the woman miscarried after this. She committed no crime. As a matter of fact, she was a victim of another crime before this crime happened to her. Let me give you the background. This is out of Tennessee. Miss Keisha Gray, who previously filed a lawsuit against the Shelby County, against Shelby County Sheriff and the county itself. Let's put up a screenshot of Miss Keisha Gray. <clears throat> Here's the backstory to this ordeal. She and her fiance had been driving down the street looking for real estate. When they got into an argument, <clears throat> arguments happened, nothing criminal about it. Gray got <clears throat> out of the car to cool off and walk down the road. Sometimes that's a wise decision. According to a copy of the lawsuit, witness Chris Hodge, I want you to remember that name. Chris Hodge, who reported the alleged domestic abuse, made up a story that involved extreme violence and attempted kidnapping. Hodge, according to the report here, according to the filing, also pulled up to Gray's fiance's vehicle. Brandished a gun and instructed him to leave, according to the suit. Shortly after threatening the life of the fiance, Hodge, Chris Hodge, the witness who made the false allegation, according to the lawsuit, Hodge called emergency services and concocted an elaborate domestic assault that he described as an attempted kidnapping that involved extreme physical violence to include, but not limited to, a headlock, choking. Punching. He said this, and according to the report, he did it to make it justified for him pulling out his firearm. I mean, damn, that's diabolical. And he did it according to the report, just in case the plaintiff or her fiance reported him to law enforcement. So this cat pulls out a gun, tells them to leave, you gotta go. And then calls 911, makes up a crazy story to justify pulling out his gun in case he gets in trouble. And what happens next? You saw the video, um, a witness recorded the deputies confronting Gray. Uh, this dear sister, according uh, to the suit, she uh, miscarried after that, violently arrested, was charged with multiple crimes, even though she committed none. None, and they took her to jail and charged her. Uh, let's put up a picture of the police chief cause they playing games about releasing the names of these cops. Let's put up a picture of the chief of Shelby County. Uh, his name is Floyd Bonner Jr. Now I've, I've told you this before, keep this picture up. They keep playing this game where they protect cops who engage with citizens like this. They don't want to tell us everybody, they don't want to give us pictures. Fine, we'll put the picture of the boss up. All right, that's how we'll do it from now on. Ms. Turner, horrific. Definitely excessive force all the way around. And there was no probable cause as I can tell. And the camera is not lying. But she was very cool, calm and collected. As you said, I think it was it was wise of her to say, I'm gonna get out the car and go walk. But you know what, Dr. Crime, she committed. And it was some lyrics and Ice Cube song, you know, my skin is my sin. Yeah. That's not, that was her crime and it continues to be the crime of millions of African Americans across this country. This is absolutely systemic, the way that law enforcement operates in this country. It is aided and abetted. So I'm glad that you keep the chief's pictures up. And we must have not only a paradigm shift, but a total transformation on policing in the United States of America and what true public safety looks like. They did a disservice. They actually infringed on her rights to be yeah. in that space in that place and to actually be able to walk around and her saying she was pregnant, they didn't give a damn about that. Oh no, they told I mean, her to shut shut her mouth. Shut up. You yeah, shut and that would have triggered me too. You don't talk yeah. to no, especially you you know, you don't talk to no woman like that, especially a black woman. Yeah. Telling her pregnant. to shut up like she a child. 
Yeah, and, and had not committed any violation of law whatsoever, but still was charged with multiple violations of law. Uh, and just uh, for the record, um, this woman says none of that happened that the witness says happened. Uh, there's no other witness saying it. And uh, she was victimized, in my opinion, multiple times here. All right, we got more on the other side. It's indisputable, stick and stay. You're about to watch some behind the scenes footage of the Young Turks. Ooh. Now these are partial videos. If you wanna get all of them, you become a member, go to tyt.com slash join. And you'll get all the behind the scenes of me, Anna, John, JR, a little bit reality show like tyt.com slash join and enjoy this. You know what you're seeing behind me, Jersey, hold. Watch me flip this camera, however I flip it. Do I flip it like this? No, I just took a picture. I'm bitsing right now. What? Behind the scenes. Oh, okay. okay. Members? I don't yeah. have my face on. She, has, she doesn't have her face on, folks. Oh, that, that's Jared's ass right there. You can't take five minutes off, can you? No, I can't, Johnny Pie. I said it was live stream, but I was lying. It's not a live stream, it's just her members. Bitsy, this is my cat. You know what his name is? Kiki Cat. Animals are innocent. Control room and the insanity is obviously there. Right now, as you can see, I'm directing or tech directing. I'm so happy to be here. This is what like a Labor Day beard looks like for Jank. Man, you're a Young Turks viewer if you recognize me like this. <laughs> oh, thank you. You are the one person in my life who I would love to meet. What's going on, guys? This is a Bitsy or a BTS or behind the scenes with Hassan Piker, AKA Woke Bay. Oh, hi, I didn't see you there. I have finished my show, The Damage Report, and now I get into a really awkward time of the day. When I'm sitting, the control room is right there. So I can see Bart, and this is the Pittsburgh office, by the way. I'll refer to often as the boiler room. You see how it's ripped? Is it super unprofessional to wear that at a business meeting? Or am I like, cool, rebel? I just finished doing the power panel, and I'm fired up. What do you do for TYT? Not a whole lot. If you're frantically tweeting at us that something's broken, thank you because I'm fixing it. And thank you for being a TYT member. Super last thing, because there's always got to be a super last thing. Oh, that was disastrous. This has been behind the scenes, behind the scenes. Welcome to Indisputable. I'm your host, Dr. Rashad Richard. We got a lot happening today. But what do we do on this show? We tell the truth. You know why we tell the truth? Because the truth is simply indisputable. Rashad, great to be here. Congratulations on the new show. And I gotta let everybody know that Rashad and I go way back. Here's the pattern that we see in all of these Karen stories. They think they own stuff they do not own. Now, where does that come from? I don't know, maybe slavery. Maybe they think they should steal all black people. This is what happens when Karen's weaponized the police. When you're used to privilege, equality seems like oppression. It hits you in a certain way when someone is holding you against your will, treating you like you're a criminal and you're an innocent person. This is something that black people face no matter where they are. A stronger black economy lends itself to a stronger, greater economy. Don't think it's exclusive of you, it's inclusive of you. What's your beef with critical race theory? It adds more fuel to the fire of the racist tendencies that we already have. We have a generation of problems problem solvers that can remedy the problem if they are properly taught what the problem is. You know who created redlining in this country? Mm -hmm. The white liberal. I, I, don't, I don't give a damn who created it. If it's a racist uh, uh, policy, uh, racist policy, Shelly, that's here's what I don't know. I don't know. See, there you go filibustering, brother. You're scared of this truth, but you're gonna get it though. changing fundamentally, extremely, and non-linearly. It's becoming worse now. It's not when the levees burst that is the problem, it's in the anticipation of that. So I hope every human being is safe. And by human beings, I do not include multinational corporations, especially the ones that started climate change in the first place. What we're currently doing right now in cutting emissions is clearly not enough. There will be ramifications to what Trump is doing. I don't want people to suffer, but I feel like there's gonna be a lot of suffering because we have an imbecile as our leader. Yep, welcome back. We got a lot of show left. Let me read some of these amazing comments. Uh, TYT member 
Sir Wyatt Hill, the only medical condition that Karen had is being a Republican. <laughs> it is, right? Has to be. Lynn, you won't let a veteran spread COVID in your business? That's basically what she was saying. Um, Yeah, Mickey C. The Silver Hair Dragon. Oh my God, I remember when that happened. Uh, she was stopped for walking while black. Cops couldn't wait for the baby to be born to murder. YouTube Super Chat, Mike V. Uh, in the famous words of Public Enemy, by the time I get to Arizona. Beast Nation 2009. The fire department of fascists must have studied martial arts at Cobra Kai. You gotta know some history, some cinema history to know about that. Good point. Um, Steven Turner, uh, purely from a medical perspective, it's, it's simply impossible to mitigate, let alone manage a global pandemic while simultaneously dealing with an epidemic of narcissism. <laughs> of course, these carers would. Yep, and thank you for that kindness. Um, Dexy83, no shirt, no shoes, no mask, no service. Nikio, thank you, Nikio. Um, Nana Nikki, this is horrific. Why are these cops chasing a pregnant black woman? And where's the right wing outrage over the loss of a fetus? Pro lifers should be all over this, right? She doesn't fit the narrative. She does not fit the narrative. But if they had intellectual integrity, yes, they will be all over it, but they do not. Uh, David, Theo, Dr. Richie is the GOAT. Indisputable has become my favorite program of any platform. Your insight, intellect, and true empathy shine through every day. We love you, Doc. We see you. Don't ever stop. And David, I thank you for that. And uh, I love you back. We love you back. Esther, is it Brochin? I think. A baby was murdered to justify his crime. What a freaking monster. Uh, Donkey Teeth, is it Beatles? PTSD isn't covered by the Disability Act. Um, bread in to toast. I mean, Roscoe's is damn good. I will say something like that during the break myself. Okay, um, this is one of the saddest stories that you will hear. A true miscarriage of justice. A cop walks up to a homeless man, puts him under arrest, says he's another person that has a warrant. The homeless man doesn't have ID. He's saying, no, 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 whoever you're saying I am, I'm not that person. The cop says, no, 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 you are the person, it's you. We're gonna take you to jail, you have a warrant for your arrest. This guy stays in a mental institution for two years because they thought he was mentally disabled. They thought he was having a break with reality only because he kept telling them, I am not the man you think I am. Let me bring your attention to Honolulu. Let's put up a picture of Mr. Joshua Spreesterbach. I'm gonna get it right. Um, Mr. Spreesterbach fell asleep on a sidewalk. It was a hot day, it was May 2017, while waiting for food outside of a Honolulu homeless shelter. He woke up to a police officer arresting him for violating the city's ban on lying down in public. At least that's what Mr. Spreesterbach thought. The officer actually arrested him because he believed the man was Thomas Castleberry, who had an arrest warrant for allegedly violating probation in a 2006 drug case. It was the first mistake of many. Now, let me pause on this point. The arresting officer made a mistake, but I want to remind you that multiple authorities, multiple agencies, courts, prosecutors, public defenders, mental health directors, they all sign off on the same mistake throughout the entire system. You know why? Because they didn't give a damn. That's why. He had no voice, not to them. They just said, "Oh, put him full of medication. That's the problem. Let's give him psychotropic medicine. He'll come back. He'll become Mr. Castleberry. 
but he never did. For two years, he proclaimed who he truly was, okay? Um, it was the first mistake of many that led to this man spending two years and eight months in jail and a mental institution for crimes he never committed. While locked up, doctors pumped him full of powerful psychiatric drugs. Judges ruled that he was unfit to stand trial and his attorneys ignored his assertions that the police had the wrong man. His own counsel didn't believe him. You know why? Because once again, they did not give a damn about him. He has no status to them. To them, he has no real value. You know how they found out this was really the wrong guy? A medical director, one of the people who actually sat down with him, a psychiatrist, really broke the whole thing and said, wait a minute. Some of this doesn't really seem traditional as it relates to a dysfunction in your psychological development. So he Googled, looked some, looked some stuff up. Damn, not the same guy. Let me take you to this part. They could have compared social security numbers. They didn't. He gave it to them. Mr. Spreester said, hey, here's my social. With the one on the warrant, they could have compared it to Castleberry and realized they didn't match. They didn't even care about this man's social security number. Or they could have done a quick search of the internet and public court records to find out the real Castleberry had been locked up in Alaska since 2016. They didn't even do that. Instead, they did absolutely nothing. That's according to the Innocent Project. The Innocence Project got on this and did a lot of great work. Uh, January 2nd, 2020, one of the doctors who previously found uh, Mr. Spreester Bach mentally incompetent changed course, changed their mind. And after doing a little more investigation, determined that this man had been telling the truth all along. That led the state hospital's attorney to have a police detective take fingerprints. They didn't match the ones they had on file for Mr. Castleberry. Officials also compared photos. Guess what? Photos did not match. All they had to do was pause for 60 seconds and say, okay, let's just confirm fingerprint, a picture, social security number, a records check. We could find out that Mr. Castleberry was already incarcerated. We could have found that out, they could have as well. But it shows you systemic failures in the system. Because if this was a mistake, and if the system only gets it wrong every now and then, the eight, nine, 10 layers on top of that mistake would have found it out. It would have been exposed, it would have been discovered. But when there's a systemic culture of failure because of the perceived class and status of an individual, the entire chain works against you. Because the failure is not a mistake, the failure is systemic. This is one of the best examples of systemic oppression and failure that I've seen in a long time. You had literally over 80 people that touched this man's case. And over 80 people said the same thing and all of them were wrong. Ms. Turner? I mean, Doc, you know, in the black church, when, when the sermon is good, you just say amen. <laughs> amen. To what you just said, you know, I was sitting here as we, you know, reading that article until we got to the point where they said they finally took the man's fingerprints. I'm thinking to myself, are fingerprints still unique to each yeah. individual? They didn't even bother because class and yep. cast is exactly what you said. In this case, it was class. That's right. Do not care. The system is designed not to care about people of a certain social economic status. And this, as you said, was a great bad example of what happens when people absolutely do not give a damn. Thank God, though, on the positive side of this, thank God for the Hawaii Innocence Project. That's right. We, we got to shout them up and lift them up. Yes. Thank God for them. The man's still being there. And I hope he get a lot of money, even though they can never repay him for shooting them up with all them psychedelic drugs mm -hmm. and taking away almost three years of this man's life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're gonna stay on top of that story because it's still developing, okay? Still developing. Um, 
I was alerted to this by one of our viewers. This was one of those WTF stories. Uh, there's a popular TikToker, let's put his picture up. Um, his name is Key Reeves. Um, he would give people a behind the scenes look at what it means to be a federal agent. Um, he had everything from a badge to a firearm, uniform, everything you expect from an enforcement officer, except the man is no federal agent whatsoever. According to the reports, his real name is um, Riel Devin Simmons, 52 years of age, has a history of impersonating federal agents and military service. Let's put this picture up again. Okay, this story gets really, really deep and complex and convoluted. But let's go, let's go to the other picture um, from the US Attorney's Office. That, that's, yeah, okay. So he would have all of this behind the scenes of what it means to be a federal agent, had a lot of followers on TikTok. Uh, members of law enforcement followed him, you know, general public. They all thought it was legit. They thought it was 100%. And then he got exposed. Now, how did this happen? A TikToker from Georgia referred to as a witness in the case and with whom he struck a romantic relationship provided the tip to expose the con. In August, a TikTok comment caught the witness's eye. The user claimed Simmons was impersonating a police officer again. Simmons made his account private at that point, but the witness reached out to the user for more information. The TikTok user provided the witness information about Simmons' previous run-ins with the law in Colorado. The witness found it believable and reported Simmons to the FBI, keeping this from Simmons as he continued to post about his career as a federal agent. Some more details, Mr. Simmons of Dodge Center is accused of impersonating a US Department of Homeland Security agent. And the US, uh, the US Attorney's Office District of Minnesota announced. The complaint says Simmons used a profile photo that showed him wearing law enforcement gear and made several posts displaying law enforcement equipment, badges and firearms and referring explicitly and implicitly to himself as a federal agent. But employment records show Simmons never has been and is not working for the law enforcement agency. In fact, he's actually employed at a manufacturing plant via a temp agency. And even on his job application lied about working for the US government. Um, the allegations according to the report, it is part of a long string of incidents in which he manipulated individuals to believe that this is what he did. Um, why, why this baffles the hell out of me. Nina, can you make any sense of somebody allegedly doing this? I, I try not to enter the mind of a madman, <laughs> I don't want to get stuck in there. No, not at all. Um, yeah, so be on the lookout for the guy because uh, they think that he may have conned other people and uh, you know, it's just sad, really sad. Out of everything you can pretend to be a cop, okay. All right, Sister Turner, always good to have you on the show. Uh, tell people how they can follow you, check you out, all of that good stuff. At Nina Turner on Twitter, Nina Turner Ohio on the gram. Thank you so much for everything. All right, we got more, it's indisputable. I went to Kentucky Fried Chicken when I was, I first got my license like 17 years old or 78 or whatever it was. And I'm driving, I think my dad's Oldsmobile. And uh, and I parked it in a, in a place where there was two cars next to me, really tight spot and a car behind me. I don't even know how I got in there because I'm a terrible driver back then. I was an even worse driver <laughs> and on the roads I'm okay. But in parking spot, uh, spots, I have terrible spatial reasoning and I'm a mess. <laughs> and on my way out, I hit all three cars at once. <laughs> it's, I broke all records, okay? So I went, as I'm backing out, I went boom, oh sh And this side hit that car, this side hit this car, <laughs> and the back hit the third car, okay? <laughs> and I got stuck, I didn't know how to get out. Like, I went, okay, this, and then I'm like, no, and then, right? And then finally I had to stop, go inside the KFC and go, A, 
I'm sorry, I hit a bunch of your cars. <laughs> They're like, what do you mean a bunch of your cars? I'm like, I don't know. Wow, there's a bee? <laughs> yeah. I'm like this, I hit three cars. I don't know. So you guys got to come help me, okay? <laughs> okay, so so one, my bad. Really sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, number two, can someone take my car out? Because I don't, I don't want to keep hitting your cars and I'm incapable of taking it out of the spot. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brett Ehrlich with Breaking News with Brett Ehrlich. This is Breaking News with Brett Ehrlich. Hi, Brett Ehrlich here. According to EPA head Scott Pruitt, climate change is not happening. He cited a meme on Facebook he saw. When pressed to back up this source, he said it must be accurate because the watermark said it was made by a scientist. So, your move, truth. Do all of you know the Young Turks? An outlet like yourself that are willing to cover this story from the very beginning and that weren't afraid to say, hey, this is something that is legitimate. And this is why what Cenk and the Young Turks are doing is so important. Brent Welder is very progressive Democrat. He's a just Democrat. In fact, uncorrupted, not going to take big corporate PAC money. When did you start watching the show and when did you become a member? So I've been watching for 10 years, an active viewer, but also more importantly, getting out there with causes like Wolfpack. By the end of our campaign, we had organized about 22,000 individual contributions with an average of about 27 bucks a piece. And those initial people were a lot of TYT supporters as well. And looking at the world in a very different way than corporate media does. It takes those early people who believe that can really be the seeds of this movement and that has been the Young Turks. Thank you, Jay Huger of the Young Turks. Thank you to TYT and all the progressives around the country that have our backs. You know, the first and only interviews that we had tonight to do with the Young Turks as well, because you guys have been here from the very beginning, and that's what this night is all about. And I thank Cenk very much uh, for the very good work that he does. Thank you so much. We're all in this together, and, and uh, the people are so powerful, and we're going to we're gonna get it done. Thank you for your constant support. It's a pleasure to be with Rebels. I like that. <laughs> for all of the help that you've given to the Just Democrats, to Wolfpack, to help fellow progressives, thank you guys to all the Young Turks members that make it possible. Hey, this is Edwin. Uh, most of you might recognize me. Well, not me, mostly my laugh from the main show. I mean, it's gonna be hard to get the Uyghur maneuver on him. <laughs> and today, my talent is Rubik's Cubes. You gotta forgive me, I've been, uh, it's been at least five years since I competed. So that's why I'm actually going pretty slow. Watch this.
All right, welcome back. Let's go to these comments. What a show. Okay, uh, TYT member Mickey C, the Silver Hat Dragon, laughing my A off. How stupid are you? Are so many people have they not yet learned that publicly advertising their crimes on the net is not exactly wise? Nothing like providing proof to the prosecution. You really did all of their work for them. I mean, damn, at least make them earn their check, okay? YouTube Super Chat, Jeremy Atkins. Dr. Ritchie, you just proved in your last debate that the Bible says. Uh, should a man cause a pregnant woman to a miscarriage, he should be fined with a fee. Uh, the pro-lifers uh, could at least mention a lawsuit. Yeah, J- uh, Jeremy Atkins. Uh, one more thing, Doc. When can I get a copy of that Smith and Western Bible? Shots were fired. Did she survive? <laughs> that's that's funny. Um, Billy St. Amper. Um, did white privilege um, kill Gabby, the, the young lady in the news. Uh, they had been stopped after a report of physical, but a physical or physical altercation, but were able to explain it away and continue their trip. Um, yeah. Okay. Apathetic astronaut 13. This happened to a friend of mine in a way. They thought her physical illness was mental and would. And would not release her to her doctors after a cop picked her up. It took years and judges to intervene. That is so sad. Such a shame. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. In the bullpen today, I have Dr. Stan Voiger. Dr. Stan Voiger is a PhD in economics from Harvard, also has an AM, that's what fancy people call a master's degree. Uh, how are you, sir? I'm doing well, thank you very much for having me on. Thank you for being on the program. We're gonna chop it up about um, economic policies. Now, I'm not an economist and I do not hold a PhD in economics. Um, but I do some research obviously and um, I'm concerned about the economy. So I don't wanna presume what you know or believe about the economy as it relates to left versus right context. So if you would give us your sentiment. Well, I think right now things are things are slowly recovering. I think we were doing a lot better obviously than a year ago when we had just come out of a complete lockdown. I think public policy between then and now has been quite good, provided a lot of support to, to people who were struggling during the pandemic, during the during the lockdowns, uh, while the virus was was out of control, uh, I think we're now very gradually getting back to normal. I do think there are there are a couple of major concerns. I think one, we've seen pretty dramatic price increases in in, in certain categories. Uh, I don't think it's entirely clear why that's happening. Right, some of that is issues with supply chains, with shipping containers, longstanding. Uh, supply side issues in the economy, like a you know lack of housing, things like that. Um, I think separately, obviously the Delta variant and the you know just relatively low levels of vaccination here in the U.S. Uh, have made it so that the economy cannot fully recover. And so I think both of those things are are concerning. The latter, I think, we're slowly uh, starting to address with with mandates and and the like. Uh, but but I do think that. You know, it's it's disappointing to see the economy is doomed the way it is. Uh, and I think four months ago, five months ago, there was much more reason for optimism uh, than there is now. Yeah, I think you're 100% right on the supply chain because naturally uh, we coexist in a global market. Uh, so you don't have significant uh, exclusionary opportunity as it relates to commerce anymore. And I had a professor who would tell me, You don't have to look at a lot of fancy statistics. You can look at coffee, cars, and clothes. And when you see a decrease in the purchase of coffee, cars, and clothes, that means that people are spending less money because they they either A, have less disposable income, or B, they do not feel confident to purchase those things because of the market. So do you attribute this to a lack of disposable income or consumer confidence in the market, which one? So I, so first of all, let me say I'm I'm a little more sympathetic toward the fantasy statistics as you as you call them, you know, yep. gotta 
Got to defend the economics profession there. I, I think uh, disposable income, I, don't, I really don't think is the issue by any metric. Uh, I think aggregate disposable income is, is in great shape, much better than it was even before the pandemic. Obviously, there are people who struggle, but in the aggregate, uh, so much money has gone out and people uh, cut back on spending so much last year that you know a lot of people have more cash on hand. Uh, and so you know have built up more, so it's more an issue wealth in the past year now. Right, it's spending so, confidence. So, I think it's a it's a it's comfort, but it's not consumer confidence in the sense sense that people are necessarily worried about what's going to happen to their own finances next month. I think what people are worried about is they don't want to go out, they don't want to plan travel because they're still concerned about the pandemic. And then separately, I think it just takes a while for the economy to to rebuild. We see tons of vacancies. We you know I, I think. Companies are trying to uh, to build back their uh, their organizational structures, and so I think that's a little different from from a traditional lack of confidence in sort of f- people's own future financial position. I think it really is, uh, you know, the structure of the economy slowly readjusting more than that. Let me ask you this because I'm always fascinated by you uh, economic guys uh, because this stuff is really difficult to figure out trajectory modeling. Um, understanding fluctuation, fluctuations in the market. And there's some stuff financially you all just can't figure out. I mean, it happens and you're still trying to get to the bottom of why, right? So it's a lot of nuance here. Uh, but as it relates to the economy of those on the right, you know, their policies. Policy is the mover and shaker of the economic market. And then the policies on the left. If you take an aggregate, if you use one of those, fancy statistical models that you all look at. You will see clearly that Democratic presidents typically oversee a more robust market. That includes private sector growth, GDP, a decrease in national debt, at least in modern history. And then you can do a calculation from 1933 and beyond and see that Democratic presidents have created a net positive in economic factors more so than Republicans, even though they claim in their campaigns and political speeches, that they are the ones more business friendly. They are the ones that will get America working. Based on the data from the Labor Bureau and others, they're not the masters of job creation. Well, I think certainly if you look at the past 25 years, you know, obviously it's a very small sample, right? It's five presidents. Certainly the two Republican administrations have ended pretty disastrously in economic terms. I think that's true for the Bush administration, it's true for the Trump administration. I don't think I agree with you that the state of the economy is is at the control of, of the president. But it's, it's greatly so think, influenced. You know, I, the, when we get into these debates or conversations, it seems as if we, we, we want to take full credit without taking full blame. At some point, the president inherits the economy truly. Now, some economists say, you know, you have to wait for a year or two before a new president can own the economy. And I'm sure you've heard that before. So, so tell me how much influence do you think a president has on the economy, if at all? So I think in a crisis situation, right? Mm-hmm. Like what we saw last year, what we're to some extent still still seeing now, or in a situation like the one after the global financial crisis, I think their economic policymakers can have a ton of influence, but not just the president. But the I think the the Federal Reserve is perhaps as important as the president. I think Congress is extraordinarily important because ultimately Congress plays a key role in deciding the stance of fiscal policy. And so I think even two years after a president enters office, I don't think you can give the president you know, full credit or full blame for whatever is going on. Though obviously I agree with you that politicians like to, like to claim credit and deny, deny fault. But I, just as I don't think you know, the Trump administration should get, should get Full credit for the pretty strong state of the economy in early 2020. I don't think the Biden administration should be should be either blamed or credited for what's for what's going on now. I think that's I think that's just not not really how it works. I don't think the the president has as much power when it comes to to macro economic policy as he does, for example, in foreign policy, right, where the president has much more control over the. The, the levers of power of the American government. I think it really is a mix of external circumstance, Federal Reserve, Congress, and the president 
as well as to some extent state and local decision makers, which have been you know much more prominent, much more visible, I think, during this crisis than they were in 2009, 2010. So I, I just don't think you can do that direct link, though I understand the attraction. And I do agree with you that both politicians and voters like to draw those connections well, in a and much there tighter are way than I would. Because there are significant influences. While I agree that all of these variables do count as well, the President of the United States is in a position of significant influence, not only to enhance policy, but also create consumer confidence, even if it's a new type of consumer confidence because of a post COVID or inside of COVID reality. Let me push back on something about the modern president. If you calculate back from 1933, all right, so you get a bigger sample size. Under Democrats, since 1933, the growth rate on average for non-farm jobs increased, <clears throat> excuse me, um, by 2.8 percent under Democratic presidents, compared to only 1 percent under Republican presidents during that same time frame. And then you go to your GDP. Your GDP grew annually. Under that same time period, once again, a larger sample size by 4.6% under Democrats compared to only 2.4% under Republicans. Now, I bring that to your attention. I understand you have a multivariable universe here, and we will have to do some pretty deep research analysis to bring to the forefront all of the variables. But you can't say that every single time is just a coincidence, because in order to believe that every time there's a Democrat, I'm talking about every time in modern history and since 1933, you have seen a significant increase in the enhancement of economic factors for blacks, for Latinos, for whites, all the way across the spectrum, more so under Democrats than under Republicans. What are the policies? Emphasis in training programs, funding for education. Emphasis in workforce ready programs or work source or workforce development. You have all of these dynamics connected to social policies within the Democratic Party that equated to a more stable workforce that absolutely put more food on the table of the average household. 100% of the time under Democratic presidents, the average family median income increased 100% of the time. So brother, you cannot argue. The statistics, I'm a statistician myself. That kind of coincidence, brother, that's, you would hit the lottery before you got that kind of significant statistical congruency, right? Well, again, I'd say man, that's that's what five Democratic presidents, five Republicans. It's a small, you know, that's you can. I don't think you can you can summarize, uh, you know, basic modern world history that way. How many presidents? Right? Like, what was the what was the most important economic history FDR implemented? World War Two. What was the most what was the most uh, important uh, economic policy uh, President Obama implemented? Right. It was probably. Uh, you know, just being there as the economy recovers from the global financial crisis. Well, let you know? me let me answer that. You ask a question, let me pose an answer to you, um, because what happens? We look at economic policies in the bubble. There's something that President Obama did. A couple of things he did that are not related to economic policies, but they impacted the economic reality of many. Um, one. He instructed his DOJ to aggressively prosecute and find companies that engage in discriminatory pay practices. And what happened? It increased the pay of women, it increased the pay of black and brown folks. They did that. That was a policy that but had that to- That is, you know, like, and we can agree or disagree over whether those policies are valuable or effective. But well, that is well, not- Wait a minute. That, the, is not a, doctor. that is not a policy that explains a 2% difference in GDP growth. Well, doctor, I'm I telling you a policy Obama that explains. Air, the, I think sir, in the, in the Obama years, the most effective economic policy, I think was probably TARP, right, which kept- So uh, doc, I'm, I'm not disagreeing that TARP yeah. is massive, but let me explain to you some of the variables that I believe contributed to these stats I'm gonna read to you. Uh, under Democratic presidents, black families increased their incomes by damn near a thousand bucks, okay? Um, under Republican presidents, it only increased by $142, all right? Once again, that's your aggregate count. Um, under well, Democratic presidents, unemployment rate fell by 7.9%, but it actually went up by 13.7 points under Republicans. Latinos have a very similar 
um, data set where, okay, now you have a Democrat in place, you have a better financial or economic outcome. You cannot dismiss the reality of the DOJ's decision where you got black folks being paid, or black males in particular, black females, the number was worse. 80 cent on the dollar of their white counterparts in a similar um, job with the same background or similar background. Under the Obama administration, that number started moving in the right direction where we're going to 81, 82, 83, 84, 85 percent. And then when Trump gets in, he then tells his Department of Justice to basically abandon that aggressive program. And all of a sudden, now the pay disparity has dropped back to 70 cent on the dollar and below. That's a real cause and effect relationship that does actually impact the economic reality of Americans. And yet, at the near the end of the Trump administration, the unemployment rate for for African Americans, for Latinos, was lower than it had ever been. Right, so those those bigger macro forces, I think, just completely outweigh the kind of policies. So let's talk about unemployment. I think if there's something you should you should give Democratic presidents credit for, it's the more is the broader civil rights legislation from the 50s, 60s, 70s. I do that. I think made a really dramatic impact. You know, not just morally, not just in terms of freedom, but economically too, where enormous groups of people suddenly had yeah. a better chance of, of participating in By the, the way, economy. By the way, Doc, fully. you just cited what I cited. The anti-discriminatory policies implemented by the Department of Justice under President Obama derived this authority from that same Civil Rights Act. You just said what I said. For sure, but I'm saying the actions during the Obama administration, I think were relatively small ball compared to those earlier developments. The other Let's major development that explains you know, a ton of the labor force and labor force participation growth over the past 60 years, of course, is the, the changing role of women in society. I think that's a you know broad development originally, you know, probably a little more Popular on the Republican side, then from the 60s on, of course, a major Democratic priority. And so those kinds of policies, I do think, are important enough in a macroeconomic sense to really make a difference. But they yeah. are slow moving, and I don't think you can attribute those to specific four year time windows, right? That's just a completely right, so, different. So Donald Trump time gets scale. no blame and gets no blame and no credit, correct? Donald, Donald Trump gets blamed for plenty of stuff and gets credit for, for some items. Yeah, I <laughs> All think right. that's a, that's so, a so reasonable me, way to let put Let me it. bring your attention to something you just said about unemployment. Uh, that black and brown people were employed uh, at a record rate. So let's talk about the unemployment numbers. Uh, naturally, the unemployment numbers were moving in the right direction under President Obama. Uh, it, he actually had a record increase of uh, job or private sector job growth under his administration. Uh, Trump kept it steady. It was not a record breaking increase, but he didn't blow it, okay? Now, I mean, it went low, a lot lower than people thought was possible, right? And you, you, I think one thing you can give him credit for, I don't think he thought this through in the same way, but fiscal policy was much looser, right? There was there were large tax cuts during the Trump administration. I think fiscal policy was looser than people thought was was reasonable. Yeah. And instead of inflation, what we got was was very low unemployment rates and 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 relatively right. fast wage growth. So so the tax cuts under the under the Trump administration were more so tax shifts. I think uh, because were, I think they were reasonable. Well, sir. I expect, yeah. All right. The tax cuts under the Trump administration were actually tax shifts because most Americans paid more in actual taxes per year than the tax cut. You already know that, correct? Well, that's just that's just not true. Practically okay. everyone so, got a tax. The tax cuts and jobs act. Practically every everyone ended up paying less taxes than they did before. Sir, that that's 100% untrue. What I will do next time you come on the show, and we'll invite you back. We will we will specifically talk about the taxation system under Trump, as opposed to what he promised. I'd love to. But what I want to do, and not my producers will tell me I got a few minutes. I want to take you back to what you said about unemployment for Black and Latinos. Okay, because you guys like to say that number without providing context. Are you familiar with the U3 rating system? I am indeed. Okay, you're familiar with the U6 rating system? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you already know what I'm. Those about. are the fantasy statistics that you were you were attacking earlier on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so 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 you could say that, but brother, you just said, oh, more black people were employed, more Latinos were employed, and you know better, Doc. Because they were using, the administration was using a U3 rating system, which basically is a 30 day survey model that says if you have technical employment, 
Technical, one hour is technical. If you have technical employment, even if it's seasonal, if it's contractual, if it doesn't pay the bills, if it's part time, it doesn't matter. That system, that U3 rating system will say employed, employed, employed. However, the U6 rating system will provide context and nuance. The U6 rating system will say, okay, this is seasonal, this is contractual, this really wasn't a job. They only work one hour or they only work one week and it provides significant background. And when you calculated the U6 rating system, you found that black people were either unemployed or underemployed at a rate of 22%. But even economists like yourself, you will come to a debate and say, "Oh, they were employed. No, they were not I, actually employed. They couldn't pay bills with that. I think you're, I think that's, that, that misrepresents what, what the two different uh, Rates represent a little bit. First of all, both come from the same survey, right? It's the same Bureau mm -hmm. of Labor Statistics survey that you extract those numbers from. What U6 does is it has a broader conceptualization of the labor force, right? So it counts more people as being willing or available to, to, to and work. And it also counts what kind so, of work it is. And so automatically it produces, just by construction, it produces a higher unemployment rate. That's true for African Americans, that's true for Latinos, that's true for white people too. Right. But that's not, you know, that it's just a broader notion of what it means to be unemployed, and that broader notion was also at a historically low uh, level near the end of the but Trump don't administration. You think again, I don't want to give the Trump administration credit for that. That was obviously an economic expansion that started during the Obama administration, right? It, and you know that just ended with historically good numbers. Uh, right, so I don't Doc, think there's a point in denying that. Yeah. Doc, think about it, man. You have a freaking PhD in economics from Harvard. Right? You don't think it's misleading to simply throw out the U3 rating system knowing that that's not a true representation of the workforce, nor the true representation of a person's ability to pay the bills. Because I think it's very difficult to capture the entire state of the of the of the economy, of the labor market, of the workforce, of people's well-being in one number, right? That's why we have these different uh Concepts of the unemployment rate. That's why we measure disposable income. That's why we measure GDP growth. Right? There's many different dimensions to to the state of the economy. I think U3 measure is an important one. So is the U6 one. They all moved in the same direction. They were all doing pretty well in early 2020. All right. And then the pandemic came, and obviously, you know, the Trump administration did not respond well to that. Yeah, it, it went to hell because of the politics that he placed before. Uh, the science of what was happening around them. I, I think that it was a major disaster. Uh, and I also have said this on the record. If Trump would have handled COVID properly, he would have got reelected easily. Now, I, and listen, Democrats, they weren't terribly excited about voting for Biden, but they were hell of excited to vote against Donald Trump. And there you have it. All right, Doc, I'll bring you back. We'll talk about the taxation plan in Anytime. more detail, man. Anytime. All right. It's fun, man, debating Very with good. a PhD in economics from Harvard. There you go. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, brother. Yep, All right. Down. Ladies and gentlemen, remember, take care of yourself, take care of each other, and take care of the planet. Remember, the truth is always indisputable.